Good morning, folks, and welcome to our online worship service for November 28th, 2021. And a special welcome to those of you joining us from outside of the St. Joseph Island area. Many of us have been alarmed by the dramatic increase in COVID-19 cases in Sault Ste. Marie and area. And some questions have been asked about whether worship will continue as it has for the past seven weeks. And the answer is yes, for the time being, with masking and distancing. But as with all things pandemic related, this could change at a moment's notice. Algoma Public Health has reinstated capacity limits, which do not affect the church at this time. So in-person worship continues with the video option for those who have concerns. So, church bulletin joke time. There's a story about a certain court jester who went too far one day and grievously insulted his king. The king became so infuriated that he sentenced the jester to be executed. Members of the king's court beseeched the king to have mercy on this man who served him well for so many years. After a time, the king relented. Only enough, though, to give the jester his choice as to how he would like to die. True to form, the jester replied, If it's all the same to you, my lord, I'd like to die of old age. Let us center ourselves for our worship. We light this light in the name of the Maker, who lit the world and breathed life into us. We light this light in the name of the Son, who saved the world and stretched out his hand to us. We light this light in the name of the Spirit, who encompasses the world and blessed our souls with yearning. For thousands of years, First Nations people have walked in this land. Their relationship with the land is at the center of their lives and spirituality. We are gathered on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe of the Ojibwe, Ottawa, and Potawatomi, who are partners with the settler peoples in the Robinson-Huron Treaty of 1850. And we acknowledge their stewardship of the land throughout the ages. I invite you to join with me in a call to worship. We have chosen to be here where God remembers us. God comes to us, the one who was and is and is to come. Like leaves skipping over the carpet of grass, God comes to us, the one who was and is and is to come. 
like the first glimpses of the sun peeking over the horizon, God comes to us, the one who is and is to come. Like the moon lighting our way on a cloudless autumn night, God comes to us, the one who was and is and is to come. I invite you to join with me in the prayer, uh, prayer of approach and confession. Almighty God, from the beginning of time to the end of eternity, you have chosen to use your power and majesty to love us, to redeem us, to shape us as your people. King of kings and Lord of lords, you became weak so you could confront the strength of sin and death, confounding their ridicule with your resurrection. Spirit of God, resting upon us, may your power inflame us with your peace. May your peace touch us with your grace. May your grace fill us with your hope. And may your hope, God in community, lead us to your kingdom. Shout for joy, children of God. The God who was and is and is to come loves you, forgives you, and renews you. God's Spirit rests upon us. Grace and peace are the gifts of our loving God. Amen.
Our Hebrew scripture reading this morning is taken from the second book of Samuel, chapter 23, verses 1 through 7. Now these are the last words of David, the oracle of David, son of Jesse, the oracle of the man who God exalted, the anointed of God, the God of Jacob, the favorite of the strong one of Israel. The Spirit of the Lord speaks through me. His word is upon my tongue. The God of Israel has spoken, the rock of Israel has said to me. One who rules justly over people, ruling in the fear of God, is like the light of morning, like the sun rising on a cloudless morning, gleaming from the rain on the glass, grassy land. Is not my house like this with God? For he has made with me an everlasting covenant, ordered in all things and secure. Will he not cause to prosper all my help and my desire? But the godless are all like thorns that are thrown away, for they cannot be picked up with the hand. To touch them, one uses an iron bar or the shaft of a spear, and they are entirely consumed in fire on the spot. This morning's psalm is Psalm 132, verses 1 through 12. And if you have a Voices United, you'll find it on page 855, and we're reading part one. O God, remember David and all the hardships he endured, how he swore an oath to you, a promise to the mighty one of Jacob. I will not enter my house, nor will I climb into my bed. I will not give sleep to my eyes, not even let my eyelids droop until I find a place for God, a dwelling for the mighty one of Jacob. At Ephrathah, we heard God's ark was there. We found it in the region of Jear. Let us approach the place where the Most High rests. Let us kneel in worship at God's footstool. Arise, O God, and enter your resting place, you and your mighty ark. Let your priests be clothed with righteousness. Let your faithful people shout for joy. For your servant David's sake, do not reject your anointed. You made a sure promise to David, a promise that will never be revoked. One of your own children I will set upon your throne. And if they in turn keep my covenant, the teaching that I give them, their descendants too shall sit on your throne in succession forever. This morning's Gospel is taken from the Gospel of John, chapter 18, verses 33 through 37. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, So you are a king? Jesus said, You say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, What is truth? This is offered as God's wisdom for our journey. May we walk in its truth. There are all sorts of titles used to describe Jesus in the Bible and they're mostly loaded with meaning. Often though, we get so used to them that we just use them like names. We say Lord as if it meant no more than saying James or Emily. On this Sunday each year, we are reminded of another of those titles and called to reflect on what it means. What does it mean to call Jesus our King? Does a title like King of Kings just roll off the tongue out of habit, or do we really mean something by that? And if so, what? It's not an easy question to answer. 
In fact, it's one of the more problematic titles given to Jesus. It's per perhaps more problematic than ever nowadays because the way we think about monarchy as a system of government has changed. And that inevitably alters the way we hear the title. The title king has always been problematic, though. Just look at the way it's used in the Gospels. The phrase, the kingdom of God, appears frequently in the Gospels. But the description of Jesus as the king does not. The only place you will find the word king used in reference to Jesus in any of the four Gospels is in the context it appears in this one, in his trial before Pilate, the trial that leads to his execution. Even then, it's not a title that Jesus welcomes or even accepts. When Pilate asks a second time whether he is claiming to be a king, Jesus says something to the effect of, that's your word, not mine. And yet, the Christian tradition has had few problems exalting Jesus as our king. It is probably not hard to see where the image of Jesus as king comes from. We are looking for language that describes someone who rules over us and over everything. Someone who is not dependent on, the ballot pa on ballot papers to secure their right to rule. Someone who is awesome and admired and honored. For the Jewish people of Jesus' day, the, mo the memory that most naturally evoked such imagery was the memory of King David. For the Jewish people, David was the archetypical great leader. In his day, Israel had been united, prosperous and at peace. And so, in the popular memory, David was the king whose rule brought them such desirable things. In times of national chaos and insecurity, Israel would look back on that golden age and wish again for a king like David. The reading this week from 2 Samuel, which we are told contains David's final assessment of his own reign, reinforces this rosy image of the king. He compares the rule of a just king with good weather. It is like the sun rising on a cloudless morning, gleaming from the rain on the grassy land. When you have a good king, everything is wonderful, or so the king would have you believe. But there are problems with the memory of David as a king and with transferring those memories onto Jesus. However rosy Israel's memory of David was, when you read the actual stories, a much more troubling picture emerges. However much Israel may have benefited from David's political genius, he was also a lying, lecherous, murdering so-and-so. His power went to his head, and as so often it does, it corrupted him. Power became more important to him than integrity, and he began to regard himself as being above the law and above the petty moral restrictions that the common people were expected to live by. And isn't that exactly the problem with calling Jesus a king? We don't actually have any examples we can point to of kings who were not corrupted in some way by their power. There's a line in The Pirates of Penzance by Gil and Sullivan. Many a king on a first-class throne, if he wants to call the, his throne his own, must manage to get through more dirty work than ever I do. And that's the king of the pirates speaking. There might have been some who haven't stooped to murder like David did, but the Machiavellian impulse to protect one's own interests at all costs, seems to be a universal characteristic of kings. 
It's going to be very interesting to see what happens to the way we feel about using king language of Jesus when there is next a king on the British throne. The troubles and scandals of the royal family over the last 40 years have changed forever the way most people think about monarchs. But our use of the word king for, the, uh, for Jesus has been inoculated from the problem because there's been a queen on the throne instead. It will come as quite a shock to many Christians to be suddenly using the word that they are used to using only of Christ to speak of Charles. It might even provoke a rapid rewriting of some of our theology. What we can see when we look at this discussion between Jesus and Pilate is that the gospel writers are clearly pointing out that if we are going to think of Jesus as a king, we had better be clear that we are talking about a radically different model of kingship than that which Pilate subscribes to. Jesus and Pilate are almost talking past each other because they're talking about such different things. Pilate, of course, is not showing the least interest in what kind of theology of power Jesus might hold. He simply wants to establish whether this man before him presents any threat to the stability of Roman rule in Israel. He's not particularly interested in guilt or innocence, right or wrong. Like most of his kind, Pilate had little difficulty in ordering the execution of an innocent man if it would help hose down any revolutionary fervor among the masses. One of the things to note from this exchange is that Jesus makes little or no, no attempt to allay Pilate's fears. If anything, his answers are likely to be seen as provocative. His assertion that his kingdom is not of this world and that his followers have no need to fight to protect him could have sounded like a bold challenge to Pilate. In a sense, Jesus is saying, yes, there is a revolution, and yes, there's nothing you can do about it because it is not vulnerable to the only sort of power you have at your disposal. Those who want to say that Christianity has nothing to do with politics have to remember that this trial had a very political dimension. Jesus does not try to argue that when people give their total allegiance to him, that Rome should not feel that there is any threat to its power. However, it's equally clear that Jesus is not simply talking about setting up an opposing rule to that of Rome, which would operate on essentially the same understanding of the nature of power and the imperative to keep the people in submission. The theological rewriting of the concept of kingship began long before Jesus. It can be seen in the stories of David, even though David fell woefully short of the ideal. The emphasis placed on David's background as, as a shepherd was no accident. The image of the shepherd is the most frequently occurring theme in the Bible's theological presentation of the ideal king. The shepherds of that era virtually lived in the fields with the sheep, leading them from good feeding place to the next, protecting them from all dangers. The image of the shepherd who was so attached to his sheep that he would protect them with his own life if need be was an ideal that in, was invoked to describe what a king should be, and which was, of course, later used to describe who Jesus was. You can see Jesus alluding to this in this story. When the Gospel writer records him saying to Pilate, everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice, there is a clear link back to Jesus' description of himself as the Good Shepherd back in chapter 10 of John's Gospel. 
He goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him, because they know his voice. They will listen to my voice, and they will become one flock with one shepherd. So in John's Gospel, in particular, the image of Jesus as king is a complex image that is played with an ironic, with, in an ironic way. Jesus is dressed up in a purple robe and a crown of thorns and called king as a form of ridicule while he's being beaten and humiliated by soldiers. He is still dressed up as a joke when Pilate questions him about his status as a king. The gospel writer is deliberately interweaving these three images, the imperial king of domination, the shepherd king who lays down his life, and the mocked and humiliated joke king, and challenging us to think carefully about what we are saying when we glibly use such language to speak of Jesus. It is one thing to speak of Jesus reigning over all creation. It's another to lump him in with the kings that we have known in this world. The gospel calls us to give our allegiance to Christ and to allow him to reign in every aspect of our lives. But we had better be clear about what we are and aren't saying if we want to call him king. Thanks be to God. Amen. Friends, through our offering, we are now offered the privilege of sharing in God's ministry. Let our hearts and spirits overflow with generosity as we give both for the ministries of this church and of the whole United Church through its Mission and Service Fund. Please join with me as we offer thanks to God 
for the gifts that we share. As we offer our gifts in this moment to you, Holy God, we pray that they might be used to bring hope, to bring healing, to bring new life to all your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us once again join together in prayer. Ever-present God, source and ground of all that exists, present and active everywhere in the universe, your gift is life. May we be empowered to embrace life's possibilities with positive energy. May we be helped to deal with our self-doubts, to control our inner fears, to lessen our self-criticism. May we be helped to find that inner release and that outer confirmation to live life fully, to live life as connectedness with God, with nature, and with all other people. This gift of life has provided us with many excellent experiences and a range of possibilities are before us every day. May we have an attitude of openness that draws us toward the best experiences and the best possibilities. And may we be prompted to be more expansive and more inclusive as we accept our responsibility to make God's reign visible through gracious generosity. We recognize that the world will be a better place for more people as we combine our concern for personal objectives, achievements, and successes with real efforts to create conditions for an informed community awareness and social change. May we live out this concern and this effort. May people see in us the spirit of appreciation, gratitude, and generous self-giving we have seen in Jesus. We lift up before you those of our congregation and community, grace them with your healing presence, that they may feel your love in ever increasing and amazing ways. This is our prayer in Jesus' name, who taught us to pray together saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
Let us go forth to serve God's children in weakness, so others might find the strength to live. Let us go forward as powerless as Jesus to empower others with hope. Let us go forth with our arms full of the Spirit's peace, so the world might be healed of all its brokenness. May the God of love and justice accompany us. May the Spirit surround us with grace and peace as we walk the path of Christ. Let all those who do justice and love kindness say Amen. Shalom, everybody. I'll see you next week.